All right. Hello and welcome to Immunity Africa. Here we share the stories of impact making Africans in business, culture, and faith. We're asking the poignant questions around the issues of Africa and asking ourselves what we can do to make the world a better place in our backyard. Uh, this weekend is probably a precarious period to host a conversation of this nature, given the commemoration of Christ's death and resurrection, the sad conversations around death by domestic violence, and of course, the war in Ukraine and Russia. But at Uniti, we are one year old tomorrow, and it just makes for a good day to have another uh, intellectually stimulating conversation around the issues of Africa. Today, we're going to be talking about Africans in the diaspora. And I have two amazing guests to have that conversation with. So if you're joining us from wherever you are joining us, do post your location, uh, do share the link to friends as we have this conversation today. I'm going to turn over to our guests and I'm going to start with ladies, the lady in the house. Uh, Christabel, I'd like you to please introduce yourself and what you do. Ken, so thank you so much for having me. My name is Christabel Dadzi. I am a senior social protection specialist at the World Bank, and I have a passion project, which is called Ahaspra. Ahaspra means aha in tree. That's the Guinean look, one of the Guinean local languages, and spora stem of the diaspora, essentially befitting who we are, which is people who have been in the diaspora and now have come back home but with one big goal to make a difference. And this organization I formed in 2011, so we're just over 10 years old, and we've been supporting the transition pro process for Guinean returnees mm -hmm. by supporting their comeback and also galvanizing them to give back. So that's a short version of who I am. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. That's absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm going to turn it back to Ladi. Please introduce yourself and what you do. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good day, everywhere where you are. Um, my name is Ladi Tokosi. Simply put, I'm academic by career. Um, I'm an economic development enthusiast. I'll stop there for now. Awesome, beautiful. So we are going to see what that means uh, in detail as we go along. What that academic means, <laughs> and we're going to also learn a little more about a haspora uh, in this conversation and about uh, the Africans in the diaspora. So let's just get quickly into it. We have about, about an hour now, um, and uh, wherever you're joining us from, whenever you join us, announce yourself and announce your location uh, from wherever you are. So let's get it started. Um, before I go ahead, I'm just going to let people stream into the call with this short advert while we uh, while we start off. James, it's great to see you. Welcome to Iwinati, uh Africa. Uh, one minute, please. <laughs> Right, welcome back. And uh, we're gonna go straight into the conversation. Glad to have you join us, um, James, all the way from Canada. And uh, we're gonna have a, a world-class audience today as we have this conversation. If you have questions during the call, please post them in the chat and we'll read them out at the appropriate time. This conversation is structured uh, in the form of a, uh, an acronym, if you like, DEPART. And the first word of that acronym is the word dirt, that is famine. The leadership expert, John Maxwell, says that everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Many Africans have given up hope on African leaders. Uh, they conclu concluded that we have no leaders at all. We just have politicians who try to woo us at every four year cycle. So I want to ask Ladi to start this conversation asking, do we have a problem of leadership? Do we have a case where leaders are driving people away from, from homeland? 
So, uh, Larry, let me let you take that up very quickly. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, leadership, obviously, is critical to every resource because leadership is the main centerpiece that organizes all resources for efficiency or the opposite of it being inefficiency. When you have hopeless leaders, then the world speaks for itself. Hope is lost. Less hope. Here we have African leaders who generally, in the main, 55 countries, but in the main, political leaders are tend to be career-driven, career um, career politicians, um, seeking power to a large extent, um, who should, by all means, be um, avoiding the concept of rulership, but tends to go more towards rulership in, in the main, because um, power is what they seek. Um, the real concern is power and rulership leads to the concept of command instead of consult. Now, when you want to consult, you would see leadership there present and the absence of consultation to a large extent and the absence of um, um, cooperation would lead to a large extent to command. And that's where we find um, Africa right now. It takes us more of command than actually cooperation. And cooperation added with the concept of consultation would lead to competition. You can be more competitive as a leader if you actually combine those two. But here we have a case where, you know, leadership has turned into kind of a profession, not just for one generation, but it's now becoming a generational career uh, and it's very profitable, very lucrative actually. Now leadership generally can be servant and that's what servant leadership is most about. Political leadership is more about servant leadership, not really master. You are more of a servant of the people. And there we have the situation where the other side of the equation is followership. And this is what people don't speak about. They don't speak more about followership than leadership. They okay, I'll focus on leadership and leadership. The most developed countries tend to focus a lot more on followership. And if your followership is organized, then leadership will represent the followers. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening right now. The first question about followership is, do you even know the difference between community? Do you know the difference between community and society? And do you know the difference between communities or the relationship between community, society, and nation. If you don't even start from that basic premise, then obviously you will not even get to the concept of patriotism because patriotism is the centerpiece of political leadership, which also be servant leadership in a way. And unfortunately, in all theories of, of leadership, the, 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 the main leadership is not even the companies. The main leadership is actually the organizer, the arbiter, the political leadership, which tends to be lacking. So to a large extent, if I come back to your question, just to make sure I stay within the frame of your question, um, I would say, yes, African leaders are technically driving away the skilled force. And the drive for power, the desire for control, the desire to command and to secure um, the future for their own generations coming behind, who are becoming the next political leaders, unfortunately, is creating a kingdom, not political leadership. And kingdom is rulership. Kingdom is not based on political leadership, it's based on rulership. So you have this complete mismatch between what they should be doing as leaders, instead of building from bottom up, it's becoming a case of top down. And that's command. That's that's not cooperation. That's not consultation. Unfortunately, that's where Africa is. And I would agree with you that yes, to a large extent, Africa is kind of um, effectively, and I think intentionally, chasing away the skilled force. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, Ladi. Uh, African leaders are turning into rulers, building a kingdom for their families. That's a very serious allegation, if you like. And I would like to have the. <laughs> I'm sure there, there'll be views and responses on that as well. But let me let me push further into the conversation. The assumption we've made in this conversation is that there is some kind of a mass exodus. There's some kind of an exodus. Is this real? Is it real? And uh, you said that leaders are driving away uh, the, the, particularly the skilled workforce. What does the data tell us about mobility in Africa and outside Africa? Please share with us. Uh, thank you for that. To do that, I would have to share my screen with some data sets. Uh, any luck? Yes, yes. It's okay, can you see the Excel screen? The first thing I want to address is the definition of the concept of diaspora. We have to start with the definition of diaspora. And diaspora, to a large mm -hmm. extent, is by definition, 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, join us. So it's not for me to say what it is, but the concept or the topic today is about diaspora. And diaspora will have to start with this definition. Now, who is a diaspora or who is in the diaspora? Now, um, sorry, it's just a bit. That's the definition of a diaspora. An individual or a member of networks, associations, or communities who have left their country in their physical form, but maintain, key critical, maintain links with that country. That's the um, definition by the International Organization of Migration. Very important to put that in context. Then we also have the question of Africans in diaspora. What are the numbers we're looking at? The numbers we're looking at is on average about 140 million, which makes up about 10% or 10, .10 to 11% of the African current population. Um, there's no data that kind of hardly breaks it down into smaller strata or any demographics. But about 10, 11% of the population is kind of in the diaspora. Or Africa is growing at an average rate of about 3.2.5 to about 3% per annum, which is about 3.25 million new Africans on average to about 4 million Africans annually. And that's quite a large number in terms of 3%, you know, in terms of the overall growth. Um, when we look at the Africans in diaspora, it says here that the global remittances, this is where remittances fit in, and I think that's where the data will be coming into the context of today's work. Or today's submissions is that um, the remittance flow has increased generally in Africa by about nine percent during the year. Um, interestingly, North Africa, Egypt particularly, Egypt particularly has been able to raise remittance of about thirty billion, which is about five point five six percent of the overall global remittances. Interesting in the, Egypt alone. It means that Egypt is a large extent has a large population or expects to have a large population. Maybe not a large population, but maybe a very high net worth. Um, or earnings, earnings capacity overseas, possibly. Um, the general perception is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has basically had 56 billion, and um, not Africa, so that's about Africa, not Africa, sorry. North Africa has about 56 billion coming in, in terms of remittances, and um, Sub-Saharan Africa had had about 45 billion. So you can see that North Africa, with the proximity to Europe, and to a large extent America, seems to be a very important channel for remittances. Now, one important thing before going into data is this is the sentence is a statement by um Narajan Murphy, the Murphy, the guy who owns um Info, Info, Infosys in, in, in um in, in India. He says, Well, in God we trust, but um, everyone else must bring data to the table. And this is where we are now. Um the data on the table suggests that this is where the main destinations, the main destinations, sorry, these are not origins, these are actually destinations, sorry. Sorry, remittances origins. Now, most migrants overseas or diasporans overseas seems to be more in the US, UAE, interestingly, Saudi Arabia. It's very interesting, these two, that Saudi Arabia and UAE that don't really have taxes seem to have a higher level of migrant force, I think coming mostly from Asia, Switzerland, Germany, China. Put all together, and you have about remittances from all over the world of about 377 to 500 billion. Now, putting that data into context, you will see here. Okay, so it doesn't allow me. So the US generally is a major source of remittances in the world, and remittances only represent about 0.3% of the US GDP, which is very tiny. Although in, in United Arab Emirates, it's about 12%, Saudi Arabia about 4%. They allow such money to leave their shores because you know, to a large extent, they have a huge migrant, migrant workforce. Now, put into context. Those remittances, if I go to the right, seems to come from this destination. So in Africa, based on the data found, published data, the, the, the history of migration over the years has been in this frame. So I'm trying to put it into frame. Has been around this frame. And you can see the main countries, and you can see Egypt quite particularly, somewhere around the numbers that have been going overseas. Now, if I put it into data analysis, just on the data sets there, what is look? Looking like when analyzed in more detail, it's suggesting that um trying to fit everything to one screen, which is possible. Can you still see the screen? Yes, please, we can. Yes, we can. can see all can. data. Okay. So where you see Egypt yeah. generally, 1990, the total population that was migrating was about 11 million, 11 to 12 million, which was about 1.86 percent of the population of Africa. By 2020. 10 years later, the population migrating had gone from 11.8 million to about 28 million. 
which is making up about 2.6%. So in terms of ratios, it's increased. In terms of numbers, it's also increased, even though the growth has also increased significantly. So what you're looking at here is that the number of increases and the change in data suggests that only, I think only one country, Ethiopia particularly, I think it's because they had some wars around this time, but generally Ethiopia was the only country that had a lower percentage growth in terms of numbers living. But there was a significant increase in numbers over, over the years. I think it's about one, one, 136 percent, which is about 1.3 times. And if you look at these mm -hmm. numbers, it looks like the numbers are migrating out or exiting Africa seems to be quite significant. And when you break it down into more detail and you summarize it into regions, then this data comes forth. Um, Central Africa particularly was not represented much in the top numbers migrating. But if you look at the numbers here from East Africa, and the percentages, you would see clearly that um, number one, there seems to be a very serious increase here in East Africa. It's about 36% increase. Um, West Africa, Southern Africa used to be quite significant, but actually has dropped significantly recently. Not sure, I think there's more inter-Africa migration going on there. West Africa has picked up quite significantly. And then when you come to the point of um, um, numbers reconciling the numbers i try to reconcile the numbers to this this 28 million to this 28 million here i try to reconcile them using these data sets and that's what i got here but that's not the main thrust of what i'm trying to drive at my main thrust of what i'm driving out here is more of the countries that actually migrate now before i dive but into that let me quickly go into these data sets here from mpi the migration policy institute now this is a whole very well presented chart of migrations from different regions. So before we say Africa migrates, let's even look at internal migrations first, mm -hmm. not very significant. Emigration, basically, not immigration. When we change it to uh, migration outside, then you begin to see a better picture. So well, the data would have actually indicated the numbers emigrating, and you'd have seen bigger bubbles. The, the brown bubbles would have indicated a lot more immigration. It's not really showing, sorry very slow. Okay, I'm just going to move okay. away from that. So when well, we look at the countries, sorry. So look at the countries where basically people are migrating to the destinations. And which is why it's very important that I freeze this where they're migrating to. Here's the population of the country. Here's basically the, the weight of the top 10 countries that people are immigrating to. Interestingly, the numbers of top 10 countries is almost the same thing as the number of Africans migrating 140 million. Then we look at the numbers of where they migrate to, seems to be somewhere around here. We look at the general GDP. Why do they immigrate there? It's because of the income, the income differentials mm -hmm. in dollars. So we look at the GDP per country, and it looks quite high generally, except this country, Russia, who doesn't have really much. But generally speaking, if you go to the right of it, um, GDP per capita, we try to look at so, uh, the living standards in terms of cost of living. So you have this income, for example, in the US, you have this cost of living, and you have very little money left. Only Germany, I think, has a quite a significant amount of income left. Now, what I try to do is to use those ratios to understand why people are migrating there. And I looked at the exchange rates. Is it because of exchange rates that people are actually moving to those countries? Is it the African exchange rate that is depreciating that's possibly causing people to go overseas so they can have more money to remit? If you look at Europe generally, or these countries where they migrate to, the average or the, the typical inflation rate or the so-called exchange rate differentials in 10 years, between 2012 and 2022, has always been about 20% plus. Now, the, the other countries would actually migrate most. And these are the countries that migrate most. India, Mexico, Russia, China. So Africa is not, it's just one of those countries that migrate a lot too. And the exchange rate differentials for those countries has been quite significant. Africa particularly, and we'll come to this data set here, Africa particularly has had a very bad exchange rate problem. And when you're not very productive, your exchange rate falls. If exchange rate falls, what happens? You end up with a lot more poverty, and to a large extent, people want to go overseas because they feel that every hour of their living life is worth earning in dollars or pounds. So you depreciate your own currency. And when you look at this currency depreciation over the years, if I remove the excessive ones, these are quite excessive. A country like Somalia, for example, maybe during the war, let's just remove those excessive ones. Um, the excessive countries are in thousands. I'll just remove them because they can give a better, they're most like outliers. And then the average rate for regions will then come to about 89% in Africa. 
53 countries data, and on average, you'll see that Central Africa seems to have the least, and I think it's because of mostly the French francophone countries. They seem their CFA seems to have been held on stronger than other African countries. But generally, mm -hmm. you see the countries here in terms of North Africa and Southern Africa, their currencies have actually lost value more. And when you put that into context, then this other set of data would make sense, which is what we are looking at um, here, the next one. So we take the same countries again. I exclude these countries because I think they are unusual. Their data is very unusual because China seems to go overseas and they, they do go to work and maybe run business. It's not really as migrants per se. But generally, when I put the data in and I run it across by population, by country, um, I notice that China, uh, India particularly, has a similar demographics like Africa. That's about 1.3 billion population. Africa is about 1.3 billion. Um, the, the average numbers in diaspora is about 17, about 1. something percent. Africa has 140, which is about 17, 10.7%. But the interesting part is when you look at the amount they remit, their national income, their remittances on average, they remit about 75, that's India, remits about 77 billion. Africa remains about just 80. Similar also, in terms of income on average per capita, the general per capita in India, in India, I'm trying to use India as a real proxy for Africa. India is about 1.9, I think it's about 1,900 per capita. And Africa is about 2,000, funny enough, on average, Africa is about similar to India. But if you look mm -hmm. at the Indian, in terms of their income capacity overseas, I use the average rate of 5%, I get different rates anyway. I tried 5% to say, okay, look, if somebody actually sends so much money back, so this kind of money is what they send back, and they actually are paying from the after-tax money, it means that they are earning about this much. If you use 5% as the typical tax rate and the social yes. services rate, it's not realistic. But then you say 1.5 trillion in Africa is about 1.6 trillion, which is not really less comparable. But if you change that to about, say, 25 percent then obviously the income they're earning will be less because what we're trying to use we are using the remittances as a proxy i mean there's a lot of data done here but it's a proxy i'm trying to work on but what i'm trying to drive out really is this to summarize is to come here and say when you put the data into graphs at 25 percent cost of living or so-called social cost what it comes down to on average is that you see that india seems to have this green line for india represents so I'm just trying to pull it up. The green line would represent income from overseas for India. India has a marginally far higher income overseas than living locally. And that blue line, if they were living locally, that's what they would have been earning. And if you follow the same thing for mm -hmm. Mexico, and obviously the remittances are a fraction of that income, that marginal difference. This is the remittance. You go to Mexico, Mexico seems to be marginally less. But when you come to Africa, Africa seems to reflect almost exactly the same proportion of what they earn overseas and what they earn locally. So there's a marginal difference between what they earn overseas in dollars and what they earn locally. Now, one of the big problems with that is the exchange rate. Massive exchange rate differences. And when the exchange rates are bad, I don't have enough time to do all that here, but generally when I try to work on the exchange rate, if you look at a bad exchange rate, for example, use the best exchange rate, which is North Africa, which is here, Central Africa, for example, you will notice the graph that the marginal difference between the income earned overseas and the income earned while local is very little. But when you change it to a worse currency or a worse rate, let's say with this percent, you will see that this graph would, is not marginally different, but you see a serious difference here, that the graph will come worse. What I'm trying to drive out really is when your currency is very weak. Unfortunately, so I have too much data to do today, I don't have the time. Mm. Unfortunately, end up with a disaster where your people would want to go overseas because they can do more in their lifetime per hour than staying local. So for me, coming to the question you asked about Exodus, Exodus is real. Um, and the driving force is a lot more economic. Um, while we have other social issues like um, the um, dislocations, we have issues of um, displacement, we have issues of danger, security, we have issues of um, traveling for discovery, education, for example, we have desperation, we have disasters, we have disruptions, we've got displacement. All those Ds are pushing people overseas. And unfortunately, the first people to go are going to be the skilled force. So, yes, yeah, the data suggests that Africans are moving overseas. Exodus is real. Data validates that. Exodus for me is necessary because it leads to renewal. If it leads to renewal, 
At least you look at the story mm. of Moses. At the end of Moses, Moses, you know, went to Egypt and the Egyptians, the Israelites went to Egypt. They learned for so many years how to build the most successful economies. They, they built the economies and they went back and built their own. The question is whether it's organized. When Exodus is not organized, then you have a crisis. Uh, let me stop for them now because All right. Thank you very much, Ladi. So we have been to an, M is it a, what, a data science course right now? I mean, a short data science course. And that really is I yes, but I'm going to I'm going to try to summarize it a bit, and I'll, I'll allow you to confirm or deny what I've I've picked up. One of the things is I, I like you said at the beginning was you gave us a very godly perception of data. It's only God that doesn't have to prove Himself with data. The rest of yeah. us have to do so, and you've done that with us. But I also see that immigration is very profitable, given the remittances, uh, the figures that you've given to us. But profitable at what level? Maybe at the family level. Uh, I've also seen that uh, it looks like Africa is not necessarily gaining as much from these remittances as other regions because we are disadvantaged by uh, our low productivity and bad exchange rates. And we need to uh, look at what we can do about that. That was a lot of data. I'm going to turn over to Christabel and uh, I'm going to uh, ask questions around her thoughts and experience on this um, issues. Ladi has given us the data, given us the, uh, the reality on the ground. Uh, one might think, I mean, if people are sending money to such la in such a large amounts, they must love their country. But how do we juxtapose that with the tendency to to leave. So the question is, uh, does immigration tell us anything about patriotism of the typical African? What are the lines between the survival instinct that is natural to all humans and the need to see the bigger picture of repairing our nations? Christabel. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I think um, it was great to see the data that Ladi uh, provided because data is always important. Um, but I think he ended on the right notes, which is that what he showed doesn't tell the whole story because there's also a positive migration story out there. And I like to focus actually on the positive side of things. Um, you know, it's a very, very good question about patriotism, because if you look at the African stories, if you want to bunch it um, by countries, you saw independence around the 60s. Ghana started uh, first sub-Saharan Africa from 57, and then you had a whole slew of, of countries after that. And what we found there is a, a crop of people who were extremely patriotic, right? Um, you move forward to, I would say about the 80s, depending on the country, 70s, 80s, you had a group of people who were patriotic, all right, but economics became a big deal to them for various reasons, from the coup d'etats to uh, economic crisis around the time and all of that, and it caused a major um, uh, migration out of the continent, right? Then you come fast forward to, I'd say, another 20 years, early 2000s, you actually see another set of Africans who are way less patriotic on, on the whole, right? Because they were, for the most part, either not born or were babies during the um, independence movement. So they don't have that feel that maybe their parents and grandparents have. And they met their parents who were focusing primarily on economic gain, right? So they also, when they, when they can, leave. What you find differently in that last subset, and I like to focus on that, is they came back home different than their parents. So you have parents who stayed abroad, Germany, USA, and the like, all their lives. Some people have been died out there or would come back home late retirement towards the end of their life when their lives, when they're very limited in productivity. Some may come and volunteer their, their um, skill set and all of that, but not as much. But then you come to these 2000s and going forward, and then you see a movement. Now that movement happened some intentionally, and I think this is where Ladi is right, is that it needs to be intentional whether it's going out or coming in. Going out became a thing because our globe became a little bit more connected, in my opinion. 
And so if you had the means, you could go. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not taking out the very true stories of people who leave and go across the Libyan uh, deserts and all of the stuff to just so they reach Europe. That group exists, it's real, and it's not a good thing. And countries need to look into how to fix that. But there is a big focus now on the positive migration and the positive return. And I think a lot of countries are really focusing in on it. What you find is that because Africa does have the potential, the positive return is happening more often with younger people. But it's because of certain things that are different. A decade ago, maybe two decades ago, a young person couldn't come and lead an organization. And I'll use Ghana as an example because I know it very closely. You found in the 2000s, um, 2010 going on, when the U.S. economic crisis hit and hit hard, that when young people were fired from their jobs on Wall Street and they had no choice and needed to return home, they return home, but here they are running the telcos across the continent, running the finance systems, the investment banks. So people actually realize that there is something here for us, right? And the, the truth is once you come home, you may have a focus that is economic, but for the most part, you also find yourself solving problems that you can't solve abroad or you can't make such a difference abroad as much as you could at home that the patriotism tends up to some extent. That being said, there are all real frustrations, there are political turnovers, there's you know all these issues of economic downturns that make it difficult to make that decision to one, come home and make the decision to two, stay. And I think that's where you know, the, the, the diaspora movement becomes very important. I like to look at it, honestly, past remittances. I think remittances tells an interesting story, but for the diaspora, it's way more than remittances. It's human capital. It is who we are, what we've learned, the new people we become, and that is what needs to be turned around to what we can give back to the continent. Let me stop here. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. The human capital aspect. And you've said so much uh, in that period. And I, I picked up from the 2000s, you have a whole bunch of professionals returning because they had acquired capacity to make a world of difference in their homelands. And they saw that there are opportunities to make the kind of impact they, can make, they could make in their homeland that they probably will not be able to make out there maybe because uh it wouldn't be because they had stronger skills among those who were born in those countries or those who are born in those countries had better opportunities and on all that so basically i i get that part so uh, essentially you would call that patriotism the, the willingness to return the absolutely willingness to return. it is it is not a it is not a decision i mean some people just make the decision because it sounds cool but to be okay. very honest with you when you're living in the West, when you pay your bills and things work, you don't just get up in the morning and leave, right? Um, but I also, you know, the truth also is being a foreigner is tough. It's yeah. a fact, you know. You you find people who are thriving, but is that the story for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So then now that people are realizing that there's many opportunities to be innovative on the continent, returning home becomes a real option. Okay, so patriotism not uh being opportunistic right it's 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 it, we are seeing it more positively like that <laughs> absolutely like, and some people yeah. can be both to be honest okay. you mm -hmm. you know and, and I, I think i've learned that a lot more by uh being affiliated with a, a number of people who are more on the business side i'm a development worker so i tend to look mm -hmm. at things at that angle but people who are business people think about it an entrepreneur who moves home and opens up a technology hub as an example what do they do? They're making money because technology now is making money, but they're hiring people. What is that? Giving back to your country. So it's really yeah. the way you yeah. look at it. So about people returning, uh, the World Bank says that 85% of, of Africans earn, be, earn below $5.5 a day. So the middle, upper middle class about 15%. And we find out that those who have gone abroad uh maybe like yourself maybe like Ladi and others and say okay i mean there's so much opportunity in africa and and someone who has never been abroad is asking himself you're saying that because you've had the opportunity you're saying that because i mean 
I, I want to come and say the story too. I want to leave so that I can tell the same story in reality. So what do you think about that? Uh, an African desperate is saying that, look, uh you, you you can say that because when you come back the government of ghana gives you a special place to live in you don't have to live among and all that i mean what do you think is, is that the reality or uh, are, do, are you still convinced that i mean coming home is is a good thing to do go ahead no so 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 kenneth the, the reality is that you know i'm a qualitative researcher so i like to tell stories and the stories are very different for different people but i've always said to my friends that if I had a lot of money, the first thing I'll do is put an empty plane at Kotoka International Airport in Accra and get all youth who will fit into that plane to leave, right? And what I'll do is I'll take them to the US, which I know, which is where I lived for a long time. I will take them to Wisconsin, which has snow like three quarters of the year. I'll take them in February, when it's the, one of the most difficult times to be there. And then I'll leave them there, right? because the reality is that everybody needs to see from themselves. So I really take to heart what you're saying, which is that people say, because you've been, and so you don't want somebody to go. Why? A lot of people don't tell the truth about that, that, that immigration. What did they go and do? You know, folks will go and, you know, do all sorts of manual labor that they would never do in their home country, work for 20 years, and then the first time they show up home, they're in gold chains with the Mercedes Benz. And truth, you earned it. I give it to you. But is that the true story of the immigration? There's that group. Mm -hmm. There's also the group like me who went to school. I went to the U.S. for school. I didn't go to I didn't go to go work. Right. I did end up working and all of that on the side to make a different uh, to to make a, a living, um, stay afloat, and and all of that. Right. And then I actually did a few jobs before I actually came home. That's my story. Now, for me, yes, for a lot of the people who returned home, they would be treated as expats, but why not? Mm. If expats, you know, if foreigners in, 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 in are treated a certain way, why can't uh, Guineans or Africans be treated that way as well? So there isn't something wrong with it. What you can say is there may be something wrong with the system that sets things up that way. And that is where governance comes in. And some of what Ladi had said at the very beginning about what types of leadership do we have and what does it mean? That is where we have the problems, is that systems need to be set up so that people who are home and for whatever reason decide they're going to stay home have the same opportunity as people who've decided to leave and come back and have, you know, have the same opportunity as expats. Because that is a system, uh, systemic discussion that I'm, I'm willing to have and a challenge that I think needs to change. That being said, you have American friends who would come home. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with some friends who came home and she one lady was comparing herself to her sister. She lives, the, the lady I'm talking about lives in, in the US and the East Coast and, you know, doing very well, pretty, pretty okay. And then she comes home and she's talking about the, the life we Ghanaians are living comparing to her sister's house, what is in the house, the number of cars, all of the stuff. And she's like, my God, there really is something here. And that's the reality. Mm. Yes, for only a small proportion, let's be real. Let's not, let's not distort the yep. story, um, but it is possible. And, and that is what I like to focus in on is telling our story and being able to tell that positive story to demonstrate that it is possible for more people to come. Because the reality is, brain gain couldn't be better. Why don't we try and work our way towards getting more of the brains that we've had abroad home? There is a place for everybody. There's a place for the Guinean or the African who's never left. There's a place for the one who went and decided themselves to patriotically to come home. And then there's a place for the person who will never come, you know, remittances. So there's a story to tell across all of it. And yeah. I think that the key there is for us to take a look at each version and see how we can turn it into a positive story. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christabel. I feel very strongly that Ladi has a, a short response to that, the hopeful things you've said to us today. <laughs> now, uh, you've said to us that yes, everybody has a place. Uh, there's opportunities in Africa and uh, it's not as rosy as we think elsewhere in the world. 
uh, if we can choose to make a better place for us. So, so uh, we, we are going into the conversation of remittances. I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, it, like I said at the beginning, it seems very profitable to have my son go from my village. He earns a degree in MIT and Harvard and Boston, and he suddenly becomes mega wealthy simply because he could get an opportunity of education or whatever else he, he could get that he could not get at home. At the same time, um, you're saying that we have to maybe have a plan that says after you've learned, come back home and uh, create what you call a brain gain, so to speak, for us. Now, where, where's the balance to that? Uh, let me start again with Christopher. Where's the, where's the balance to that? What do you think is more is better for us? Do we re help, receive the remittances, start businesses, uh, or we, we, we should be asking our people, come home and make a contribution locally? Christopher first. I think it's, I a, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. That's the true story. Um, mm. Like I said, we were talking before we got started. I don't think everybody should come home. You know, mm -hmm. there are some people that, you know, they go and it's their place there. They get better opportunity, better life because the system setup allows them to do that. And theirs is to give money back home. You know, as, as we all know, remittance dollars, you know, it's not even the true story. There's a lot more that is being is not being recorded in terms of what comes back home. So there's an e mm -hmm. e extremely economic gain. Um, in 2020, Ghana's remittances during COVID-19 shot up by 5%. So that tells you that there's a big economic gain there. But there's also, like I mentioned before, an even bigger gain when you bring back your human capital, when you actually immerse yourself in the society to make a difference, right? Um, and so the key becomes, how do we harness this? People are doing so well in agribusiness, in technology, in you know development spaces, in, in neuroscience, across the gamut in terms of, of areas, Africa is thriving. So why should we let non-Africans thrive in Africa? We should come back and make a, and make a difference ourselves, be a part of the, the real story. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So uh, it's I, there's a pastor in Lagos, uh, Pojo Yimade, who used to say that your labor is found in the house of strangers. So essentially those who are outside your environment are seeing better things in your house than you are seeing yourself. Let me read a few comments before I come to Ladi to respond to that. Patrick says she nailed it. Innovation opens up unbe unbelievable, unbelievable opportunities for diaspora Africans. Maybe it is the fact that when you go abroad, your mind opens up and you're able to you know, plug it back home. Maybe that's the case. Thank you, Felicia, for joining us. James says, my friends who are immigrants have a back home, a place, where they have ease of returning to. To me, they are lucky. They can return, <laughs> in quote, home if they wish and make a bigger impact than they can uh, there. That is beautiful. I mean, yeah, that, that is it. So someone who, he, James is in Canada, he's Canadian, and uh, Canadian, Canada is his home. So, I mean, he sees somebody who is not from Canada and he says, look, you have a home to, that you can actually contribute to, which is so easy for you to contribute to. And that is an action point for us. So, Ladi, what do you think about this this balance between remittances and coming home to make impact? Um, it's sad that my system shut down. I have to go on my phone. I can't display more data. Now, if you look at the if you go on the internet and you look at the top twenty five economies, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. We look at the top twenty five economies, and India that has an average GDP of one thousand nine hundred dollars per citizen. Is actually number six above France, above Belgium, above Switzerland. Go and check it. Now, what I'm trying to get at is this. The Indians overseas are making an average $28,000 on average. I mean, there's disparity, but on average about $28,000, while the Africans overseas are making an average about $4,000 to $6,000. Now, you don't understand what that means, really, to foreign exchange. You don't understand what that means. India's currency for 10 years has only depreciated by 56%. African currencies has depreciated by close to 200 to 300%. What, what is that telling you? Um, it's telling you that being overseas is not a problem. Being in the diaspora is not a problem. It is necessary because you bring in the ideas, you bring in new ideas, you bring new contacts, and you don't understand. Going overseas is not really about running away. It's about opening new channels. 
The opportunities you open is what you open down to bring down home. But unfortunately, because of the way people go overseas, disorganized. Let me give an example. The Foreign Commonwealth Office in the UK has over 14,000 employees working in all their embassies, 270 something embassies and, 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 and consulates all over the world. They bring in 625 billion pounds a year. Now, the US foreign, um, the states, I've forgotten the correct, the state, state department, they got about 14,700 embassies and consulates in 168 countries plus around the world. They're bringing in 4.6 trillion US dollars. Do you really think those people from the US who are overseas are not called diaspora? And then also diaspora. The Indians overseas, are they not called diaspora? The difference between Africa and them is that they are very organized. There's a mission. And that's why I said in the case earlier, using the analogy of Moses, the Israelites had no mission. It was God that gave Moses the mission to take them out to where he wanted, but he wanted them to learn how, a big, how to build a city before he took them back to the promised land. Africa has no clear vision, no leadership, no organization. In that context, when you describe small snippets of people who come and live, let me give you an example. Ghana's VAT has gone from 4% to 19%. Now you're telling me examples of Ghana. You're telling me examples of people in Ghana, but I'm telling you an example of Ghana as a whole. Ghana is the worst performing currency in Africa right now. I would want somebody to speak to that. You can tell me one or two people, snippets, who can even live safely because of the disaster on the ground. If you are not organized, in terms of embassies, in terms of diaspora, understanding that they need to connect with themselves and build communities like the South Koreans are doing, like the Russians do. I'm sorry to say that with all these small snippets we pick up, we are very good at magnifying small things. We are very good at taking the smallest thing and magnifying, oh, we see, there we go. How much do they contribute to the economy? This is what we are struggling with. We magnify the small things, it's almost like Pennywise found, found foolish. We magnify the smallest things to give it some, some kind of flavor, while the biggest things we don't work on. India is 1,900 US dollars per, on average, and India is the sixth largest economy in the world, growing three times the rate of America. Try to look at that. If you really want Africans to come back or even contribute to diaspora, you have to make that currency valuable. And the only way you can make the currency valuable in Africa is to increase your productivity. You need diasporans, you need locals, but you need the system, the systemic. That system is missing. And that's where it comes to the beginning of this discussion, leadership or lack thereof. Wow, well, thank you, Ladi. Uh, we're going to take a short breather, and then we'll come back. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the strategy. Uh, when Ladi spoke, he mentioned India, and I, I remember China, and uh, some other East, Af East, um, Eastern, East, Far East countries who had a strategy over a period of time of brain gain, a brain gain strategy through emigration or through the diaspora. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and when we come back, let's just take a breather, sink in a bit, and we'll be back in a minute. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they are mom. Yeah, they are mom. Yeah, they are mom. I'm here to cry, they are mom. Power. I won't go. Ah, seconds view. Ah, I'll see you in 10 seconds. That's my food. You know? That's my food, you know. We are waiting. We did this. We brand this. They are looking so much. So if I brand it, I'll bring a few in your mouth. Umpa, umpa. I'll bring them out. All right, star eight nine nine star four zero hash. That is the code to get uh, lunch as a salad if you're in Ghana, in Accra particularly. So let's get back to our conversation. Uh, we, you're listening to Unity Africa, and we've been talking about African diaspora, the nuances, uh, the the balance between remittances and a brain gain, the whole conversation around should we be leaving or should we be returning? Who is leaving? Who is returning? Uh, who is asking us to return? So I'm going to uh, well, I'm going to ask Ladi to touch a little bit more on the concept of a strategic approach to um, emigration that benefits the whole of the country, of the nation, of the continent, rather than a few people. Ladi, would you like to say a few on that, please? 
Um, thank you. I think I think the first the, the driving force of it, I think, is still going to come down to the reason why people actually go overseas mostly, which is education. Education is the biggest mind mind um, developing system you can ever think about. I mean, like I said in my previous video, I did with you. Um, the Europeans came to Africa, Ethiopia. They came to Egypt. They learned. They came to study. Um, the Chinese went to America to study. The Chinese went um, all over the world. They were picking up, and they're still learning. They're still learning. So. If you really want to change the dynamics, you need to first build a strategy from your education, because your youth are the largest population and they're the game changers. Now, those youths have to be well-developed to global standards, at least to degree standards. And you need to connect those local with those, in, it's, it's not a rivalry. It's supposed to be a cooperation between those who are local and those who are international. And with technology now, it's so easy that you actually can bring in a lot of the best skills in every area and develop your human capital. Like the Indians have done. Indians give their students loans to study overseas. Do you think the Indians are stupid? Sorry for the language. The Indians are sending loans to their... So the parents have to give some security against the land or property. They take the money, they go to overseas country where the currency is good. But the Indians, Indian government knows that many of them would likely not come back. But the difference is the Indian provides the platform for the students, the young people, to actually become useful. When you go to countries where they allow you to work 20 hours a week and you're earning more than your parents have earned for the last three years locally, then you have this mass flow and you have the numbers. You have them going overseas, they're developing themselves, but then they're also connecting locally. Because anybody who makes a lot of money overseas will still look back home, so long as home is no hell. If home has a good currency, if home has need for opportunities to increase their capital, the truth is there's no real growth in Europe. There's no real growth in America. The growth is in the developing countries, the so-called um, underdeveloped countries. That's where the growth is. I mean, growth is simply building something up. There's no road, there's no water. When there's nothing, there's opportunities everywhere. But if you don't build the human capital, start with education. When you have the right set of education, you'll get the right set of leadership. And once you've got that leadership in place, cooperate, consult. Compete, not with yourselves, compete against the best. There's hope. Thank you very much. Education is a strategy. And uh, I'll, I'll, turn to, I'll turn to Christabel about that strategy. You see, uh, from what Ladi, you said, that strategy is being driven by government in places like India. Is it possible to drive that strategy in some other way? So maybe, Chris, we want to talk a little bit about that and what Aspora is doing. Sure, I'll tell you what Aspora is doing. But before then, I struggle a little bit with Ladi's stance because um, I'll be the first to say, yes, we have systems that are broken or we have systems that can be improved, right? There's no doubt about that. But governments are paying for students to leave their home countries from the continent. It's happening, right? So I think we should be careful in some of these comparisons. Um, that the, that's happening. Ghana just launched in 2019 the, the return home, the year of return, and now Beyond the Return is underway, and it's bringing in tons and scores of tourism. We cannot say it's not happening. It is happening. Why are we not giving the examples? Yes, you can say all you want about Ghana's um, currency, which is an unfortunate situation that is happening to us now, but can we talk about Ghana and how we responded to the COVID crisis and did so well? Can you go and talk about how Rwanda is running its economy? There's good examples on this continent, and I think it's important for us to focus in. Now, I also want us to also take a look at what is working well and what is not working well. So when you bunch Africa together, it gets a little bit difficult. India is a country, let's not forget that. And I think it's really important because people listening to us may not have the kind of skills and the kind of... Um, access that we have. So when we're telling the stories, I think it's really important for us to give that context. What is Ahaspra doing? Ahaspra was birthed from this dynamism, this patriotism that says we can make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a group of young Africans. We started in, in 2011 with 12 people, and today we have more than 3,000 people in our database, and then many, many more in our network system. What are we doing together? We're supporting each other's return process, helping each other find jobs, helping each other find housing, helping each other find the human capital that Ladi talks about and he's absolutely right about. I think I, I touched on that as well. That in the end, forget remittances. 
human capital is key. I, I will forever be on the stance that there is something special about coming and being a part of the change movement. And if you haven't experienced it, I encourage you to do it. It doesn't matter if there's just a few of us. It's actually not just a few of us. It's been a massive goal. I think we need to do better with data. And this is something I complain about all the time in terms of understanding our numbers. And some of it's tough because some of it is short term, right? Somebody may come home for two years, give their all and then head back out for whatever reason, right? Somebody may also come and never return. And both of them or even both of them are going to make a difference in different ways. Some The shorter one may even make a difference bigger, right? Um, the truth is there is growth here. This is the richest part of the world, fact. So if you're going to make a difference, you can stay in, you know, abroad in the Western world, or you can come back home with the education you gain as a global citizen. The globe is getting closer and closer together. So it makes you actually, we have this term we call global. The global person, global and local is actually your best bet in terms of you know, what, what you can achieve. The sky's the limit for somebody who understands what is happening on the ground because they are from the ground. And then the person who also has that global perspective, they've learned the mistakes, they understand the global culture. And there's a major, major role for us to play that could be very positive. And so I will push any day for brain gain. I know it's not, this is not a debate, but I did want to, to kind of give that other perspective that, there is a positive movement and it's young people. It's young people coming back early. It's not people coming back to retire. We're not counting those. That's also good, well and good. The opportunity exists. I, I think actually, and I'll end on this, one of our biggest problems is the best people are not joining government. Culturally, mm. we have this thing that governments is dirty and I, I include it, I'm just, just saying like it is, you know. <clears throat> when we can start saying that let's be a part of the solution, you know, that if you can beat us, join us. When we join, I think we'll really be able to make a difference for our countries and this continent that we also love. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you can I just keep something to that, please? Just Go ahead, a second. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. I want to make it clear and categorical that what I'm talking about is the ideology. And to assume that you only do well when you are local, I'll ask you a simple question. Do you think that video makes its money from Africa or from the diaspora in terms of hard currency? Do you think whiskey makes its money locally or Bonaboy? They make their money from the largest population in the diaspora. So, you know, let's be very careful to assume that those who are foreign are not contributing. And this is what I've been trying to say. The ideology is that the Americans have a whole network that brings in 4.6 trillion from their diaspora, not just diaspora, mm -hmm. but they, they facilitate the, the, the export of those products and they make the money from out there. The foreign commonwealth office in Britain does the same. The Indians did the same. We saw it in, in Ukraine. When there were problems in there, the first country to move in from any third world country was India. India moved in and took out all their citizens back to India. They accounted for every single one of them. This is what I'm saying. We need both sides. We can't sit in one fence and say, oh, you have to be on the ground, then you are the one that's patriotic. Patriotism is not because you're on the ground. In fact, the worst people who are destroying Africa is on the ground, those on the ground right now. The people who are seeking the the, 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 correct, the correction of this madness, if I call it, is actually overseas. Because they know better that there's good things back home, but it's not happening. So yes, we have to go between both sides, but to assume that those who are local are more patriotic is actually not very correct. That's taken, Ladi. Thank you very much for that. Uh, clarity. I'm going to read a few. We are out of time, so I'm just going to read a few um, um, thoughts from the audience. Yes, I, I think I've read this before. She nailed it. Innovation opens up unbelievable opportunities for diaspora and Africans. And, um, and uh, I, I can't see the name here. It says, you nailed it, laddie. Bitter truth. Most people return also due to racism, not patriotism. That is an interesting conversation. Okay, good. Uh, James says, Ladi made a great point about many countries using immigration as a strategic initiative. Go out there, get educated, and return with additional global education and skills and connections abroad. Connections, key one. Okay, uh, someone said he wants the data, so I'll get in touch with Ladi, Ladi on that. Patrick says, great contribution from Ladi. It's a fact that our leaders in Africa are consumption-minded. We have so much to unearth and unleash various factors of production that works from raw materials extraction to finished 
white goods for our citizens to consume. We need a systemic mindset shift. Great. Thank you for that contribution and mindset shift across the entire system. And uh, finally, James also says, yes, Christabel also made a great point that returning home is not for everyone. Sometimes staying abroad is best for them and even for the country to maintain special ties. It's been an awesome conversation. I'll just ask us to share uh, a final thoughts on this topic and particularly in your personal space, your children, your grandchildren, what is your plan for them to stay here, to go abroad? Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, let me ask Christabel first. Your last thoughts and your own personal orientation around, around the conversation. If I, if I look in, I would want any young African child, girl or boy, to go abroad. Everybody should go abroad. There's so much I have learned as a person by traveling in not just one country that I stayed in. I've worked in many countries and I've been to almost 40 countries across the globe. And every time I go, I gain things that I improve my person, improve my perspective to life, improve my professional goals and, and everything. It's, it's just an amazing place out there. So everybody as possible, and that should be our goal on the side of the world, should have the opportunity to go back. But we should make it a point to also encourage everybody to come back similarly, whether it is for a lifetime, for a minute, for a second, for a visit. It is also important to know your roots, to appreciate it, to understand your history and to give back. Thank you very much. So for me, for me to, to come, the analogy, I would like to use analogy. The analogy was a pastor who said in one of these sermons I was, I was present at, he said, if you can't go, your money can go. So, um, everybody doesn't have to be in Africa. Embassies around the world are there to open up channels for diaspora citizens of that country to take advantage of opportunities. If a British citizen, if I go into Nigeria now with a British passport, I will go to the British embassy and I'll ask them I want to do certain things. They will give me all the contacts in Nigeria. They will open up channels for me to make my business successful. That's what diaspora is there for. That's what embassies are there for. That's what consulates are there for, not just visas. Now, you don't understand what I'm going this, this This thing is very, very organized. And until they get to the point where they push their citizens to get the maximum from where they are, the citizen has no reason to be out there. In fact, the citizen will come back home naturally. So for me, if you ask me whether I want to be overseas or not, I'll go where everyone, one hour of my life, adds value to me. And if it's overseas, so be it. My child will have to, to decide for himself. The truth is, you know, I cannot move myself into where it will become my own hell. I can't naturally... Even God will forgive me if I move myself to a place that would actually he moved me to a promised land and I moved back to hell. I wouldn't. So if, if, it's, if it's going to work, I would contribute. But the truth is, you know, everybody for himself until we get organized. And I'm hoping that the diaspora will become more organized because they will become, as the currencies become, there's a, there's a diagram I didn't show you. The new, the new um, social funding structure in Europe, they call it green finance, um, in Europe, in UK and in US, is tilting towards before 2030, every industry would have to be green. Do you know what that means for African resources? Oil, oil will be a liability. All these cars you are seeing them shipping into Africa, machines they are selling to Africa for cheap, they are dumping it and they are creating new energy efficient um, equipment. Thus, it's like exciting the economy all over again. Africa would, would be in a very, very tight corner in terms of the exchange rate very soon. And the only country in Africa that is making any, any move towards legislation to move towards green energy, and I have the map, I just couldn't present it now, is actually South Africa. So the whole Africa is sitting idle, relying on resources to borrow money, and using the money to import and consume instead of producing. Um, when the green energy system, check it out, it's called the green finance. Green finance is taking serious foothold. Europe will not deal with you unless you are on that platform. And you have to borrow money to run a new green environment completely so if you're producing things through um old oil based fossils they're not going to buy from you just like what we see now blocking out russia and they're going to block you out so we are, not, we are moving into a very very critical stage that i want the at least those in diaspora to come together to understand that there is a big crisis coming a massive storm 2030 watch out wow 
All right, on that insightful note, uh, I mean, I think the action point here is similar to what Christabel has done with Ahaspora in Ghana. Wherever we are, we must begin to think of how to give back. If the government cannot do it, if the government cannot create a system of um, creating advancements, maybe the people can with some organized structures. So thank you, Christabel. Thank you, Ladi. Uh, finally, uh, James says, Ladi, Africans must get organized with purpose. Uh, Christabel, great point. Travel increases knowledge. And Emmanuel, thank you for joining insightful discuss discussion, he says. So he's been listening. Patrick says, sorry, Ladi, that opinion is not quite correct. So we'll save that for the next conversation. Just last week, you know, visited NNPC to discuss investments in oil and gas in Nigeria. Okay, that is another conversation we will have to have. So we'll have to close it out now. Thank you, Chris Bell. Thank you, Ladi. It's been awesome having you on the Immunity Africa platform. It's been amazing. And um, thank you for those who are able to join live. I'm sure this will go out even further to those who are not able to join live over uh, um, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, God bless you and have a wonderful rest of the day.